Welcome to The Hill's Coronavirus Report. I'm Steve Clemens, Editor-at-Large of The Hill. Each day we are interviewing consequential international, national, and state leaders in the battle against the coronavirus. Cooperation between cities, states, and countries has been beset by challenges since this pandemic began. With different governing strategies, disparate approaches to flattening the curve, and overburdened leadership, it sometimes seems like the onus is on Americans to figure all of this out on our own. A recent op-ed in the New York Times entitled, The Best Response to Disaster is Resilience, posits that we're up to that task. As a young girl in the 1940s in London, the writer endured daily food rations and shortages of everything. Cooped up in a tiny apartment, she got her first lessons in cooperation and steadfastness under the harshest of conditions. In a recent interview, she said, quote, we need to work with other countries because the virus knows no borders. And what we're doing is kind of acting as though this is just something about America. Those experiences made her the leader she became, an ambassador to the UN and as the first woman to serve as US Secretary of State. She is also the author of the forthcoming book, Hell and Other Destinations, a 21st Century Memoir. Secretary of State Madeleine Albright, welcome. Thanks for joining me here today. Uh, you and I have talked a lot about uh, your other books in the past, fascism, various times. But, but this is a whopper, uh, and, and the timing and the titling of the book uh, couldn't be more appropriate. Hell and Other Destinations. So I'd like to get, you know, given your um, experience, describe for us the import, the characteristics of this tough time as you see it right now. Well, uh, great, and it's very good to be with you, Steve, and uh, to have a chance to talk about this. I do think that um, when I wrote the book. It was before the virus, um, and the statement "hell" came from one of my most famous saying: "Is that there's a special place in hell for women who don't help each other." Mm. But it never occurred to me how uh, relevant the title is for today, because uh, we are exactly the way you described it in the introduction, in terms of a lot of confusion and uh, decision making in this country and how it relates to other countries and how we deal with something that uh, really d does know no borders and what our institutional structures are that can deal with this. And you referred to something out of my past, which is I believe that as my parents had no control over where the bombs fell in London, um, their behavior made all the difference. They had control only over their behavior. I think now as individuals, uh, we ourselves cannot figure out uh, about the virus. All we have is control over our behavior and how we approach this and how we figure out how to solve it, to be problem solvers. One of the uh, things that occurs to me is that Donald Trump's America First policy is something where you know the consequences of that may be coming to roost. And I'd love to get your thoughts on it. I remember hearing you one time saying, America will have its dark days. It will need its neighbors. It will need support. Um, what are your thoughts? Well, I think that the current policy of America first or America alone or America uh, thinking that it's a victim is totally wrong and counterproductive, when especially we do know that there's nothing about um, this virus that says it stays in one country or that we're not interconnected in terms of supply lines. And so I do think that President Trump's policy has hurt us in terms of how we're supposed to resolve this now when we have to work with other countries, uh, when we have to make sure that we are dealing with a virus that, as I said, knows no borders, but also needs to uh, be dealt with by countries working together, sharing intelligence information, and not trying to take advantage of each other, but to understand that the only resolution to this is cooperation. You know, your book, and I'd love to hear a bit more about your book and, and, and why you wrote this, is really not just about the place hell, it's about getting things done, about going from destination to destination, about not stopping and, you know, licking your wounds or whatever it may have been, whatever uh, uh, situation, but just continuing to move and, and deal with problems. And I'm sort of, interested in, in this challenge today because America is having, we have now uh, around 30 million people officially unemployed, probably more unofficially unemployed, major economic contraction, uh, global economic consequences to this that, that we'll be feeling the ramifications from for a very long time. And so I, I want you to convey that 
problem solving, get goingness, and why it's so important for others to, to, to take that on as well? Um, you know, I have recently had to describe myself in six words worried optimist, problem solver, and grateful American. Hmm. And um, what I really do think is all of them are relevant, but I think uh, the way that the issue is taking hold is very, very complicated, which is that there clearly are economic problems, just the numbers of people that are unemployed and uh, what it has done to not only our economy, but other economies. At the same time, there are the disease issues and the humanitarian aspect and the number of people that are not employed because they are helping on the front lines. Uh, they are needed in order to make sure that the social distancing takes place. And so the analysis of this is important. But then I think we need to understand that we have two issues that are almost in conflict with each other, that you have to be able to solve both and not decide that the most important thing is getting everybody uh, re-employed and that the business and the economy is important and it doesn't matter whether more people uh, get infected. Uh, and the other way around, that we can't just decide that we can't open up at any point and what the rules are. So the problem solving part of this is to understand the, pr the issue itself and then recognize that the institutional structures that we have in the United States need to be looked at more carefully in terms of the coordination and the planning. And then that um, even though Americans don't like the word multilateralism uh, because it has too many syllables and ends in an ism, but basically it will require international cooperation through the institutional organizations that exist. Uh, and those have to be modified and fixed to deal with the issues. So I'm in no way underestimating how difficult this is. This is very difficult and requires leadership that doesn't flip flop around, um, that is not providing any kind of, um, I think, predictable guidance for this. And that's what worries me. Look, I had David Miliband on the other day. You know David well, the former foreign minister of England and the head of the International Rescue Committee. And I know you're doing a uh, part of an auction, as I understand, a fundraiser for the International Rescue yeah. Committee um, that people can buy, you know, coffee with Madeline, a virtual Zoom coffee or something. Uh, so congrats you know, on yeah. that. But I guess the question is, he said that with organizations like the WHO, we need to go back and look at what they did. Every institution needs to be accountable, but this is the time to double down and double the support for the WHO, not, not uh, break, break away. And in Washington, some folks I've talked to about a, have been talking about the problem of WHO-ism, to get to your ism comment. How do you look at the WHO and these early days with China and what rolled out? Because there's a lot of uh, blame gaming going on right now with regards to that organization? Well, I do think uh, that it needs some fixing. I've said that people and institutions in their 70s need refurbishing, and the UN is 75 years old, and it really does need some help. And the WHO is tasked with a very difficult uh, set of issues, um, and it does need looking at. This is where I've decided, though, that America's approach is totally counterproductive and dangerous. I know from my own experience, when we decide not to pay uh, um, an organization, we don't have the leverage that we need in order to make changes. And there is no other setup like the WHO. One can rethink and decide to create something totally new. We don't have time for that. Everything does need to be investigated, but we need to look forward and we need to work with other countries, but just recognize that we cannot get anything done if we are not at the table. That is That makes clear. And David Miliband is one of the smartest people on all of this, and I think he states things very, very well. When uh, you were Secretary of State in the Clinton administration, I can imagine if you had been hit with the same kind of challenge at that time, you would have called world leaders together, you would have called other global secretaries together, you might have put together uh, you know, an international platform to tell us. Do you worry that that doesn't seem to be happening today? I don't see a global platform of coordinated effort around the coronavirus. Uh, I don't either. And I think you point out that we can't do this alone and those relationships because they have the same problems. And let me just tell you, when you call together a group of foreign ministers, 
everybody is conscious of national sovereignty, but also conscious of the issues that you're trying to solve. And so I think that it's unfortunate. And in fact, it's worse than that, because as I understand it, the UN Security Council is trying to follow something that the Secretary General has suggested, a ceasefire and working in to solve this issue and not criticize the WHO. And the U.S. is blocking that Security Council resolution. So we are not only not cooperate and not reaching out, we're doing the opposite. And I find stunning that the Secretary of State of the United States would be taking that kind of a position. You know, one of the, the things that you had said in that uh, um, op-ed in the New York Times is that we can't approach this as if it's just America. One of my other interview subjects was Mark Dybul. Mark was President Bush's global AIDS ambassador. And he made the comment that if we don't invest in the infrastructure in what developing nations, particularly in the Southern Hemisphere, have, that we're going to get a massive return of this virus to this, that, that we've got to look at their health and their public health as part of our and connected to our public health. Um, I know that you've worked a lot on the developing world. I remember a forum you did with Sam Brownback uh, when he was a senator way back when on the importance of global development. What are we not getting in Washington right now that, that legislators and the people watching this broadcast need to understand about our vulnerability by not investing in that part of the world? Well, I don't know. This was a, a statement associated with something else. But if we don't do something about this, it will come home to America. We can be helpful for humanitarian reasons, but also for national security reasons. They don't necessarily come at opposite issues. And we know that uh, some of the aspects of this will come to the developing world. They don't have any kind of infrastructure to deal with this. They don't have enough water to drink, much less to wash their hands. And their economies are uh, not strong. And so it is. we can do this out of selfish reasons, but I think something has to happen. And what is crazy is as we look at our budgets is that um, I believe in the Defense Department and our military, but there has to be a budget for the State Department and U.S. assistance programs uh, and recognize that it is not just kind of uh, humanitarian support. It is national security issues where we need to think ahead um, and make clear that um, it is for our good that those countries, the developing countries, are not buried um, in some of the problems that we're dealing with now on the virus. Madam Secretary, we're in an election season. November, we're going to have an election. When we tried to do this before, uh, we had lots of evidence of Russian meddling and folks trying to exploit weaknesses. What are you worried about, uh, given current conditions and as we approach November? What should we be uh, on the alert for? Well, I'm very worried about, I know that, you know, we always say this is the most important election ever. This one really is, given the things we've been talking about and America's position and what we have to do to solve the problems. What I am worried about is that we do know that the Russians were involved in the 2016 election. We also know that um, there already have been criticisms about, um, about mailing in ballots and all the various aspects. And there is a sense of trying to undermine the credibility of this election before we ever begin. And so I think we know that a lot of it goes through the states. Uh, we have time. We have to prepare. We have to make clear to people that the election will happen, has to happen. It may have to take uh, mailing uh, in our ballots, but it would be crazy if we decided that everything is uh, going to be normal. We know that the Russians, uh, we're dealing with a former KGB officer in Putin. We also know that they aren't the only ones that want to disrupt our election. So I think we were warned. We're now criticizing that we didn't do something far enough in advance over the virus. Uh, we cannot let this just be that, oh, well, it'll be fine. We voted before. There are an awful lot of things that we need to watch out for that require cooperation. I want to ask you just about women right now, women in this virus, women in America, women in politics. Are you heartened? Are you happy where this is? Or do you feel like, yet again, the interests and the leadership of women are being shuttled to the side? Well, I do think that there were um, the uh, uh, primaries and everything in the, uh, the Democratic Party were fair and 
uh, when, well, I think Vice President Biden has made share, clear that he's going to have a woman vice president. I do think that we can't forget about the various problems that are out there that often are carried uh, at the expense of women and that some of the things that are happening in the U.S. and also in other countries, it brings domestic violence and the variety of issues that we have always been concerned about. What I find interesting is that um, there are articles about the fact that the countries in which uh, they have been able to deal with the virus are those that are run by women. New Zealand, Taiwan, Norway, uh, Germany. Um, and the question is why? And some of it has to do, I think, with women's capabilities in multitasking and having peripheral vision, understanding that one of our main uh, jobs as uh, officials is to take care of people. Um, and I am what I, one of the reasons that I decided to write my book was to show that I was going to be able to do the kinds of things I cared about in office, out of office. Mm. It took me a while to find my voice, and I'm not going to be quiet now. And women's issues are, for me, top of the agenda, along with democracy. They go together. Just to wrap things up, and really enjoyed this conversation. Um, I want to know what your next book is going to be. This is your seventh, so I want to know what number eight is. And you and I have always had fun talking about your brooches. Um, share with our public what your brooch is about today. Yeah, well, it's uh, totally germane for this. Um, you, we talked about the fact that I'd been in England during World War II as a child. My father was with the Czechoslovak government in exile and broadcast over BBC. And I used to listen to BBC as a child, and they began all their broadcasts with the first five notes of Beethoven's fifth, da-da-da-dum, which in Morse code means V for victory. And oh. so I thought that it was uh, very uh, appropriate for this particular time, V for victory over the virus. And your next book? Well, I don't know, maybe learning to be an introvert. Uh, <laughs> I'm having a hard time with that. Uh, well. <laughs> I truly am an extrovert, and as much as I enjoy doing this program with you. It's much more fun to do it in person well, and really kind of get uh, the human vibes and, and all that. So um, I'm, I'm having a little bit of a hard time learning to be an introvert, but um, well, you can I do hope it. I don't have to be well, one. Well, I welcome getting, get to getting together with you in person. Madeline uh, Albright, uh, former Secretary of State, uh, Hell and Other Destinations, congratulations on the book and thank you so much for your insights today. Uh, thank you all for joining me today. I'm Steve Clemens. See you next week and be well.